Hey guys, welcome to our Syria Deeply Google Hangout with the amazing Clarissa Ward of CBS News. Clarissa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. You just won the DuPont Award for your unbelievable coverage of Syria over the past year and a half, practically two years through the length of the, of the, of the entire conflict. Congratulations. Uh, how did you hear? What, what is it like? Um, well, obviously, it's like unbelievably exciting to um, have your work recognized um, with an award like the DuPont. Um, it's an amazing award, and I feel very humbled when I look at the other people who have won it. Other people being recognized for their work in Syria this year, like Deborah Amos and Kelly McEvers from NPR. So I certainly feel like um, I'm an extremely good company. Um, I found out about it. I, I was sent an email. Um, and obviously it was just a sort of thrilling moment. Um, it's a little bit bittersweet because actually uh, one of my good friends who I know would really love to share this moment with me and who would be super, super excited about this is Austin Tice. Um, he's a journalist who's been missing inside Syria for four months now. So there was a moment of kind of like, yes, I won this award. I totally want to tell Austin about this. Uh, it's like makes you remember um, you know, how many people are still, you know, in such desperate situation. Austin's family just put out a plea for his release before Christmas, just around the corner. Can you tell us a little bit about Austin, what he's like, what his family's like? Just tell us a little bit about the guy we hear about so much now in the news. Um, Austin is, um, there are so many words to describe him. Um, he's passionate and he's intense. Um, he's extremely intelligent. Um, he is, you know, he can be a little bit cocky sometimes. You almost want to give him a little <laughs> or, a, or a punch, but um, he has a huge, huge heart. And he was so inspired by uh, what he was seeing in Syria all around him, by the bravery uh, and courage of the Syrian people. He was also deeply moved. Um, by the suffering, and I think intellectually he was incredibly intrigued uh, and compelled by this deeply nuanced, complex conflict uh, that is now almost two years in. So he's incredibly curious, incredibly brave, um, he is not afraid to dream big, and he's not afraid to work as hard as it takes uh, to make those dreams come true. Both you and Austin made the decision again and again to go into Syria. You went in alone the first time on a tourist visa, and that takes incredible courage. I, I imagine that something that you guys have in common and that bonds you as friends, but what is it like and, and what do you know of what it was like for him to decide to go in and stay in and stick with this story mm -hmm. when it's so dangerous to be there? Yeah, I think that Austin definitely um, is braver than I am. Um, perhaps that's partly because of his military background, or just because of the kind of person he is and and the, and his big heart. But uh, you know, he really spent a long time inside Syria. He was there for, well, he's still there, but he was there working. Um, for over three months and really traversing the country and uh, you know unlike me Austin and doesn't speak a little bit of Arabic he doesn't uh, necessarily have a lot of experience um, doing the work he was doing so I think in his case it really took an extra uh, an extra dose of, of bravery and courage and commitment and also by virtue of being a print journalist and a, and a photographer you're traveling in much smaller groups um, I have gone to Syria on my own in the past I've gone also just with one other colleague, but as a general rule of thumb, we we tend to travel in in groups, uh, television correspondents, as you well know. Um, but I would say, you know, I always cringe a little bit when people say, "Oh, you're brave" or something, because on the one hand, it's it's like it, I'm I'm very grateful for the compliment. On the other hand, I see the risks that the Syrian people have taken, um, both in order to you know further the path towards freedom, but also the risks that they've taken to host journalists. Um, and, and I feel somewhat embarrassed to be like, my bravery is not even in the same ballpark as theirs is. Um, that, you know, I just am really, I'm, I'm sort of blown away when I see the, the risks that they've taken and their willingness to, uh, you know, endanger their lives in order to further this dream that they have. You've gotten to know this revolution so well from the start, from the earliest protests. You've, I mean, I just watching the string of reports is like a, a 
perfect timeline of how this expanded from peaceful protests into civil war, into guerrilla warfare, into urban warfare, to Aleppo and your interviews there. I mean, how have you seen this change over time and, and how do you feel about just watching it evolve and, and where it stands now? I mean, it makes, me, it makes me very sad to see how the conflict in Syria has evolved for a number of reasons. First of all, it's gone on for way too long um, and civilians have just borne way too much of the brunt of this. I think there are a few things that have uh, really alarmed me or, or caught my eye during the course of covering this story. One is which uh, the way in which the regime has actively targeted civilians. I mean, it's not a case that civilians are, have become collateral damage. They've actually become an active target in the regime's um, campaign, essentially to bombard the public into submission. So that's one thing I've seen that has been um, a, a pretty alarming. And a, 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 this was always going on from the beginning. Clearly, when those peaceful protests began and they were being met with bullets, it was civilians who were often, uh, or in most cases. At, on the receiving end of those bullets, but I think because the regime started to use its air power, um, it became a, 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 on a much greater scale the level of uh, the targeting of civilians that we've seen. On the other hand, I've also seen a lot of things happening on the rebel side which have um, sort of alarmed me somewhat and, and made it clear to me that this conflict uh, is only going to get much, much worse and much bloodier and much darker and more grim for everyone um, if someone or something or the international community, whoever it may be, doesn't uh, somehow put a stop to it because we have seen, you know, the opposition remains incredibly splintered, fragmented, fractured. There's a lack of coordination and communication. There's a lack of really uh, shared ethics or morals or, uh, you know, a code which they all adhere to. Um, there has been an effort to establish these revolutionary and military councils. Um, but many rebel groups are really operating um, outside of that fold and they operate according to their own rules and often these rules are not in accordance with humanitarian law or the Geneva Convention and in some cases um, they've raised my concern that these can lead to further sectarian divisions and retaliatory reprisal killings this sort of thing all of which um, spells out or, or is sort of a harbinger possibly of a much bloodier civil war to come even after the regime would fall. So um, there are a lot of things going on in this conflict. Um, it's an incredibly difficult story to tell because it is so nuanced, because, um, because it's also so sensitive. And um, I think that one of the real challenges is is trying to flesh out and exactly what you're trying to do with your website really flesh out all the different little things that are going on here look at the Kurds let's talk about the Kurds people aren't really talking about them because it'll get so complicated but it's really so important right this incredible moment in your 60 minutes piece where you decide to take the video of rebel abuses back to a rebel commander and confront him with it I was so scared for you watching like, what is this guy gonna say to her why did you feel it was so important to highlight those rebel abuses, to take them back to him and to risk your own skin to get a reaction? I felt it was important for two, for a number of reasons. Firstly, we had heard of rebel abuses going on, and I think there's been a reticence uh, among a lot of journalists um, who have covered this to really talk a lot about rebel abuses because it's sort of, um, it veers from the narrative that everybody's felt quite comfortable with, honestly, of, you know, people fighting for freedom and then a big bad regime trying to kill them. And, and while that may have had a lot of truth to it, and particularly in the early days, like there's no such thing as black and white with these stories, um, and they are complex and we need to, you know, we're not doing justice to the conflict if we don't talk about these issues. I can't look at a piece of video of, uh, you know, of Syrian soldiers being executed um, extrajudicially and not, and knowing the person who's responsible for that and not go back to him and say, listen, can you explain this to us? Can I give you the opportunity before I put this on television to allow you to say your piece? Um, and 
I, it, it's not even a case, you know, a lot of people really attacked me after that 60 Minutes piece and were like, how dare you, you know, you're on the side of the regime, you're trying to make us out to be a bunch of crazy Islamists, and how, you know, can't you understand why they would want to kill um, those soldiers anyway, those soldiers have blood, and I'm like, guys, I'm a journalist, I am not an activist, I'm not a, you know, I don't work for a, a, a non-governmental organization, my only job, really, is to go to places to look at what's going on and try to give our audiences a, a better sense of what's happening on the ground. So, um, for a number of reasons, it was a very difficult and obviously quite frightening and intimidating thing to do. Um, but I don't regret it for a second. There's this amazing combination of smarts and heart in your reporting in general. And just reading up before our chat, this amazing line you gave the American Journalism Review that I want to ask you about. You said that you've never experienced anything like what you've seen in Syria, that it's one of the toughest conflicts to cover for security and safety, but also emotionally. What is it like emotionally? Why is Syria so much harder than any other story for you on that level? Well, usually when you're covering a conflict, uh, you know, conflict is always difficult to cover, right? If you have a heart, it's 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 painful, um, and it's distressing, and it's often very stressful uh, from a security perspective. But in Syria, it's different because because you couldn't just go and check into a hotel and have your little bubble of you know journalistic sort of. Uh, you know, distance from the conflict, if you like. I was living in these people's houses. I was playing with their children. I was eating with them. I was cooking with them. So when somebody was killed, it wasn't like I got to go back to the, the house, the hotel afterwards and, and sort of like, you know, turn on CNN and chill out for a while. No, I, I'm, I'm living with these people and I'm living through their loss with them. And um, you know, I know as journalists that we're, we are supposed to have distance, and of course, and of course we, and of course we do, and and we endeavor to be like doctors in that sense. I think, but you're also a human being, and uh, you know, and I said in that American Journalism Review article as well that I was sitting with this man who was hosting us, who was called Abu Ibrahim, and he's like such a tough kind of grizzled old, uh, wonderful character with a huge heart, but like he's a tough rebel fighter um, and his brother had been killed in battle the day before and I was eating breakfast with him and he was chewing on this piece of like the Arabic flatbread and he was just chewing and chewing and I could tell that like he couldn't physically swallow and then at a certain point he just like he just started crying and, and tears were just streaming down his face and like and he was sort of sobbing and and I said, you know, I just cry, I cried. I cried with him, and it felt like a sort of natural and normal thing to do. And um, I was very moved by it. And, and I've been moved many, many times during the course of covering the conflict in Syria because you are so deeply in it in a way that in Iraq and, and, and Afghanistan, journalists haven't been to the same extent. You found your way into Syria multiple times. Uh, it's been extremely difficult, both for the regime restrictions and for the fact that if you come into the liberated side, so to speak, as they call it, you're, there's some sort of myopic uh, experience because you're kind of with these embedded within rebel brigades. Are you worried about what we can't see in this conflict? Do you think oh, it's gotten Mary. harder over time? Very, very, very. I mean, it's 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 when you're staying with the rebels. I mean, you're of course you are seeing, you are living through their lens. You are seeing what they are seeing. You are feeling what they are feeling, or to well, to a lesser extent, but you are witnessing what they are feeling. And so, of course, your 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 reporting is going to be imbued with that sort of trajectory, so to speak. Um, we are very lucky at CBS News. We have had um, multiple uh, official visas given by the regime and uh, our correspondent Elizabeth Palmer, who's an amazing correspondent, a veteran correspondent, has been to Damascus many times and has um, sort of endeavored to give the other the other side and the other's perspective. She went to Homs, uh, into the old city with some Syrian soldiers to give a sense of, you know, how what their experiences of the fight because you know as I said before it is never black and white and it is never just a clear-cut case of good and evil and there are complexities all around and 
you know, a lot of these Syrian soldiers, for example, don't necessarily want to be there at all, but, you know, they're facing a gun behind them as well if they, if they try to turn around. So um, I do think that one of the great difficulties um, with Syria has been the fact that, you know, you only get access to pockets at a time. And because even within the opposition, because the opposition is so fragmented, you're staying with one group in Aleppo. Okay, you have a nice feel for for that sort of area of Aleppo, but you don't really have a sense of what's going on in Hama. And you don't necessarily get a good picture of what's happening in those Kurdish regions over there. So uh, I think the the one thing that's been really lacking, and again, this is where your website comes in and what I think is so valuable about what you're trying to do, is sometimes I've felt that we haven't been able to give enough of a big picture uh, as journalists with our reporting. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll continue to work to surmount that problem. I mean, one of the big passion points for me in building Syria Deeply was that we didn't want this story to disappear. We've seen interest levels come and go on so many Arab Spring revolutions. Uh, you know, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, all of these stories have kind of receded in a sense from view. Are you worried? I know you're incredibly committed to the Syria story, but are you afraid that a certain fatigue sets in and, and at some point we stop giving it its due? I am very worried, absolutely. I mean, I'm very lucky in that I work for CBS News, and CBS News, um, I would uh, perhaps biasly say, has uh, more than any other U.S. network really just uh, been so committed to covering Syria, and I have no doubt, uh, and I know uh, in terms of planning that they can, that they are committed to continuing to co cover Syria. But I worry a lot that when the regime falls, and this is always the way it is with these revolutions or uprisings or spring Arab springs, whatever you want to call them, um, the temptation is, you know, oh, this is amazing. These people are out on the streets. They're chanting for freedom, and then whoever it is falls, and it's like, oh, okay, bye, and all the journalists leave. And guess what? Like. You know, most of the important stuff happens after uh, the regime or the government or the king or whoever it might be falls. And I and I worry a lot in the case of Syria, for example, that, uh, you know, the Syrian people have been working really hard and they've paid a huge price uh, for two years almost now to overthrow the regime. But I worry that the real work, ironically, will begin after the Assad regime falls. I think it's only a matter of time before that happens, but then Syria has an enormous amount of work ahead of it in terms of trying to prevent the country from splintering into an all-out sectarian civil war, uh, rebuilding um, its infrastructure and towns, and I mean, an enormous, enormous amount of work. And I just, I really, really hope that journalists are remain as committed to the story as they are now and really see this through because this is a not a sprint, it's a marathon. Clarissa, we're so grateful for your reporting and for your time. Thank you so much for joining us in this Hangout. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.